God brings down the mighty and God lifts up the lowly. So here's our motivation for being humble. If you're humble, there's nowhere to go but up. All right? Good evening, saints. And welcome to Bible study. We're back. We've just completed our Saturday, January series. How many of you were able to participate in that? Amen. That was fun. And now we're back to our Tuesday night Bible study. And those of you who have been coming, we completed the book of Genesis. And now we're going to begin with the Gospel of Luke. So my hope is that every year we will get to do one Old Testament book and one New Testament book. So we're going to begin our study tonight with the Gospel of Luke. Do we have any folks who are here for the very first time? Amen. Welcome. Welcome. All right, so we want to begin um, with the Gospel of Luke and we'll just do a little bit of review. Um, so let's go to that first slide. Um, so we have two testaments in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we've listed the books of the New Testament. If you go down the first column, you'll see that Luke is the third book, the third of the four Gospels. And the order that we have the Gospels in in our Bible is not the order in which they were written. So Mark is older. Mark precedes the other Gospels in terms of date of authorship. Um, and so the ordering has to do more with Christian tradition and not with chronology in terms of time. And so those first four books we have then are our Gospels. We can go to the next slide, which just is a review again of the types of material we have in the New Testament. So that we have 27 books, but they are different genres. So the first four books, you know, are the Gospels. Then the book of Acts comes. And that is what we call history. It's a history of the early church. And then we have a bunch of letters, a fancy name or an older name for letters is epistles. You can call them letters. It doesn't matter. And then finally, we have in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse or apocalyptic literature in the book of Revelation. So let's go to the next slide. I wanted just to talk a little bit about the word gospel. Gospel is actually an abbreviated form of Godspell. Um, so some of you know the play Godspell. That is the old word for gospel. That's all it is. And Godspell, if you divide that in half, the God means good and spell means message. That's how we get good news. Gospel, good news, good message. All right, let's go to the next slide. So we have four Gospels, but we divide them so that there are three that we call synoptic Gospels. And one is the, the Gospel of John, which we did a Bible study on maybe a year and a half ago. John is different than the others, and it's because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, um, the word synoptic means see together. Optic and see, sin with, see together. That there is a relationship between the first three Gospels around authorship that is not the case with the Gospel of John. I also wanted to put here, and I put Luke, I put Luke-Acts, because a lot of books will talk about Luke and Acts as one unit because we believe that's how they were written. That the writer of Luke, we know, also wrote the book of the Acts of the Apostles, and that that probably was a unit that came together. And so a lot of commentaries will be a commentary on Luke-Acts. Um, if you took John out, you would have that smooth movement. And again, when we talk about the ordering of books in the Bible, there are lots of traditions that have an impact on how things come to be in their final form. But when you think about the Gospel of Luke, and you think about the themes in Luke, the author of Luke, the perspective of Luke, know that you will see those same themes in the book of Acts. All right? So it's kind of like Luke the sequel. All right? And that, so you can think of it that way. So I want to say a little bit more about the synoptic gospels. And it, you will see things in Matthew that you will also see in Mark and you will also see in Luke. All right? So we have these parallels. In fact, you can get the parallel gospels where it lays out 
the book of Matthew alongside the book of Mark alongside the book of Luke and you can see what things they have in common and what things they have that are unique and this leads to a theory around the composition or the writing of those first three gospels so let's look at the next slide <coughs> So you'll see up on the top left, MK, that's the Gospel of Mark, all right? So we start with the Gospel of Mark, and we believe that the writers of Matthew and Luke both had access to the Gospel of Mark, all right? The writers of Matthew and Luke knew what was in the Gospel of Mark. And so we see, if you see the arrows going from Mark, they go straight down to Matthew, and they go across to Luke. Do you see that? All right, so that's Mark standing there by itself, and it contributes to Matthew, and it contributes to Luke. Now, if you look down on the bottom, you see Matthew and Luke. So Matthew has three arrows contributing to it. The one at the top, it's coming from Mark. The one to its left, M, that stands for Matthew. That's the material that's unique to Matthew. All right, so far so good? Then look over at the bottom right, and we see the Gospel of Luke. Luke like Matthew, has material that comes from Mark. And then if you look to the right, there's a source that we call L. That's the material that's unique to Luke. All right? So far, we see that Matthew and Luke have material that is unique to each one, and they both have had exposure to the Gospel of Mark. And then there's that little letter there at the top on the right, and that's Q. And Q stands for the German word quella or source. In other words, there is material in Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark, that Matthew and Luke have in common, that scholars believe comes from this source. We don't know what it is. It's a theoretical source. All right. It's a way for people to account for the material that we see in each of the Gospels. So that that means that although Matthew and Luke have things in common from Mark, and though Mark, Matthew, and Luke have things in common from Q, this source, you see both Matthew and Luke have material that is theirs and theirs alone. We have four Gospels. Three of them have this common um, ancestry, if you will. John is unique in its approach and in its language and its perspective. But having said that, all four Gospels do the same thing. In other words, all four Gospels have as their goal proclaiming the good news of Jesus as the Christ. They do it from different perspectives. They address different audiences. And because they are written by different authors, it had, they have their own unique styles and their own unique themes. So imagine, if you will, that each one of us had to write um, a story about what happened in church last Sunday. We would all be talking about the same events, but our stories would not be the same. And some of it would have to do with where you were sitting physically in the congregation, what you observed. Some of it would have to do with what happened to you before you walked in here. Some of it would have to do with your unique personality or your vocabulary or your audience. So that if I was going to write about what happened last Sunday, but I was writing for children's church and you were writing for young adults, we would write differently. And so we see all of these factors going into the composition of the Gospels. Any questions about anything I've said so far? You think you covered this, but is Mark, does Mark have anything unique? Yes, Mark does have some elements that are unique. But because Mark starts the whole ball, ro ball rolling, Mark just gets to sit all by itself. All right, did everybody hear that question? Does Mark have anything unique? And the answer is yes. And Mark has its own unique writing style. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. Um, and I, some people would say that Mark is, in terms of beauty um, in writing, they, some people would put Mark at the bottom. I really like the Gospel of Mark. I think Mark is doing its own thing. Um, but we're going to do Luke. Um, so let's talk about some things that you should know about the Gospel of Luke. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I don't know if you can see that, so I'll, um, it might be too small, but the first thing is something I've already told you. Luke has a sequel, and that would be the book of Acts. All right, and so I want you to think of them as a unit. 
And then the next couple of things that we have in the next three points are things that we can see from what we call the prologue, the first four verses of the Gospel of Luke. So let me read it to you, and then we'll work through these points. So I'm reading from Luke chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to go through verse 4. And listen to what is being told. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the world, word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So the author is telling us what he is doing and why. Yes? All right. So he says, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided. So what is he telling us about himself? What? He's doing what everybody else did. What else is he telling us about everybody else and him? What's the difference between these other people he's making reference to and himself? They were writers and? No, they were eyewitnesses, but he was not. All right, so he's saying, look, he says, many have undertaken to set down the events that have been fulfilled just as they were handed down to us to, onto us by those who were eyewitnesses and servants, I too decided after investigating. So the writer of Luke is not saying I was there. He's saying we have received this from those who were there, and now I am going to attempt after investigating. Always do your homework. See, teachers love that. I'm going to tell the story, but first I'm going to do my work, right? So after investigating, I too am going to write an orderly account. And who is he writing it to? Theophilus. And who is Theophilus? Do we know? What? He's what? He's that guy. Okay, that guy. Theophilus. So Theophilus means friend of God. So does that, so is Theophilus a person or is it a generic title? All right, we don't know. Huh? We don't know. We don't know. All right? It could be a person or it could be a generic term. Friend of God. I'm writing to you, friend of God. Um, and the name is Greek. So we are assuming that the audience would be Greek and that they would be Greek Christians because he says to write an orderly account so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So these people have already been told about Jesus. They've already been instructed. And now Luke wants to write this down so we get it, get it right. All right? So in some ways, part of Luke's desire is to preserve what an already existing tradition and he wants to preserve an already existing tradition in the presence of other written traditions. All right? So he is contributing to what has already been said, which suggests that Luke may want to lend a perspective that had not yet been written. We call the writer of Luke a third-generation Christian. In other words, someone who received... The Gospels weren't written as they occurred, all right? So if the Gospels were written later on, and then he is there to, as a recipient of that, then we would say that's probably third-generation Christian. The other thing that we want to know about Luke that is really significant is that there is an unprecedented presence of women. Luke has a lot of women in the gospel and a lot of women in Acts. And I'm not going to, we don't have time to list them all tonight, 
but as we make our way through this gospel, I just want you to pay attention to the presence and the role of women in this gospel. One of the ways that we see women in the Gospel of Luke is through something called pairing. Pairing. So now look at Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 10. And here we have a parable. Luke, Luke 15, I'm sorry, Luke 15. And we're going to start with verse 4. Fifteen four. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one who is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. So in the first parable, there's a man who finds a sheep. But look at the next one. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Two parables, two examples to support the same point around the joy of someone who comes to know Christ, one outside, one inside, one male and one female. So Luke does this pairing a lot, and what it does then is just provide opportunities for women to be used as examples as well as men. Okay? It's really lovely. It reminds us it doesn't, that, that it can work. Um, Luke chapter 13 Verses 18 to 21. He said, therefore, chapter 13, we'll look at verse 18. 13, 18. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, and to what should I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. The first one, someone. Look at 20. And again he said, To what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Again, just this wonderful example of um, the, a woman, a man, a man, a woman, two different scenarios, but both are examples of how God works. Let's just take a moment and take that in. All right? In other words, God can use us in spite of our gender. God can use us in spite of our location. And just because God worked through the person with the mustard seed doesn't mean God isn't working with the person with the yeast, right? So the way the pairings are set up invite us to consider the possibility that God gets to show up wherever God pleases. All right? Okay. Um, uh, Luke refers to widows more than any other gospel, okay? So widows would have been the people in society who would, have not, who would not have had any means of visible support. And these are the people that we have been charged, that Israel has been charged from the very beginning to take care of, to be responsible for. And a culture would have been judged or assessed based on the way that it provided for widows and children. And so Luke is known for um, drawing our attention to issues of social justice. All right. And finally, um, let's not forget this one, Luke chapter 8, verse 3. Um, let's start with, actually, let's start with 8.1, 8, 8, 1 through 3. Soon afterwards, he, this is Jesus, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. Who were the twelve? The disciples. The twelve were with him, as well as some women 
who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Time out, stop, let's take a break. Because in, in the tradition of Christianity, many people call Mary Magdalene a prostitute. That's nowhere in the Bible. That's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. So if, ever, if you ever hear anybody saying that, say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That is not what this Bible says about her. But there's a tradition where that has been, that the seven demons have been associated with that because the man who interpreted it, in my mind, had his own issues. But we're going to leave that alone, all right? We're going to set that aside. What we need to know is that in the Bible, God's word that we decide is authoritative, she's never called a prostitute. Okay? Um, okay. Um, so um, these women, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod Stuart Chusa and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So these women were kind of bankrolling this whole operation. And many scholars believe they also provided meals for them. All right? Okay. The gospel, the work of God, doesn't happen without the people who prepare the food. It doesn't happen without the people who write the checks. And so what I love about this gospel is that it's telling us that Jesus and his disciples were out ministering, but that the ministry team included women. Now, we could have a discussion about the roles of the women now, you know, but we're going to leave that alone for now. What I want us to remember is that Scripture tells us they were there. Now, it's our job to remember that when we tell the story. When you tell the story about Jesus going to Galilee to your children, say, and the women... Tell them so they know it wasn't just a bunch of men out there all by themselves, that they were doing it with the support of a community. Because we begin to form a mythology around church leaders, that they spring up out of the ground fully grown, speaking in tongues. That's not how it happens, right? People who minister and serve are nurtured and provided for and fed by other people who are called by God to do that. And Luke lays this out for us in scripture, and I think it's important for us to do the work of remembering. Okay? Okay. All right. Um, any questions about anything I've said? Okay. Now we're going to go to an overall outline of the Gospel of Luke. So we begin with the prologue, those first four verses that we just looked at. All right, that's the prologue or introduction. And then we move to the infancy and childhood narratives. Now, we just, we, we just got out of the Christmas season. And so we have spent some time with the infancy and childhood narratives. And so we will, um, we're going to move through that fairly quickly tonight. And then we move to a segment of Jesus' preparation for ministry. And then Jesus goes to Galilee. One of the... Um, things that I didn't really think about until I went to the Holy Land was the difference between the city and Galilee. And if you ever go to Jerusalem, it is a city. It is busy. There is a lot going on. There are a lot of people. There are a lot of religious people. There are a lot of pilgrims. But when you go to Galilee, you can breathe. And I think now about what it might have been like for Jesus and his disciples to be ministering in the city with all of the religious leaders and all of the politics that were going on and the difference when they went out into the countryside and they ministered and what it meant for Jesus as he moved from Galilee back to Jerusalem know what was awaiting him there. And so the gospel has Jesus out in Galilee and then journeying back to Jerusalem and then teaching in the temple and then he's crucified. Okay, but that's not the end of the story, right? So we get our resurrection narrative at the very end of the gospel. All right? Okay. So what I'd like to do now is look at this first section, the infancy and childhood narrative. So turn with me, if you're not there, to chapter 1, and we're going to begin 
verse 5. And at first, I think what I want to do is just show you the basic units in this narrative. So first, we have the birth of John the Baptist, all right? And that begins in chapter 5 with the angel coming to Zechariah. Um, so 5 to 25 is the angel telling Zechariah that's gonna, what's going to happen and Zechariah not believing it, and then there's some consequences. Then chapter 1, 26 to 38, the angel Gabriel, who was very busy in this chapter, then visits Mary and tells her about what's going to happen with her. So we have news of two children that are going to be born. And then in 39, Mary goes to Elizabeth. And so in Christian tradition, um, I, just, I just lost my thought. Um, it, it will come back to me. Um, yes, it's called the visitation. So when the angels come, the angel comes to Mary, that's called the Annunciation. When Mary, Mary goes to see Elizabeth, that's called the visitation. Um, and then in verses 46 to 56, we have the song of Mary, which some people know as the Magnificat. All right? And that comes from the first word, one of the first words where she says, my soul magnifies. Magnifies is where Magnificat comes from. All right? And that takes us through verse 56. And then finally, we get John the Baptist born in 57. And then in 67, Zechariah prophesies. And then in chapter 2, Jesus is born. And you know the rest. The shepherds come and the angels. And it's very, very exciting. All right? Um, so now let's just review what happens in those chapters a little bit. So that the story of Jesus begins with the story of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist precedes Christ. He is the forerunner for Christ. He comes to prepare the way. But before John is born, the angel comes to his father. And we hear about Zechariah. He was a descendant of Aaron, so he was in the right Levitical priestly line. And his wife's name was, I'm sorry, his wife was a descendant. And um, she was Elizabeth. So both Zechariah and Elizabeth were of priestly lines, but they were of two different priestly lines, which we see a division at the reign of David. Um, the angel comes and tells Zechariah about this child that's going to be born. And what does Zechariah do? He doesn't, he doesn't believe... He questions. Why does he question? So he had a good reason to question. So I think this is important because sometimes when we read the Bible, we read this story and we immediately think he didn't have any faith. No, he just was a thinking man. And, so some, and we have to understand, sometimes God is going to call us to do things that do not make sense. And it's all well and good when we're reading somebody else's story, right? We can read about Zachariah and Elizabeth, and we can read about Abraham and Sarah. Of course God can do it. But what about when God comes to you and tells you that God wants to do something that doesn't make sense? All right? So we want to try, if we can, to enter into this situation because sometimes God is going to say something to us that makes absolutely no sense, and we will do the same thing. Um, Lord, did you happen to remember and we start listing and realize how hard it is sometimes to accept a vision that God may have for you or how hard it is to receive a promise that God has for you, even a good one, because it doesn't make sense. So Zechariah um, has to be mute because he didn't get it right. And um, not too long ago, Pastor preached on this. It's a really good series, so I commend that to you. So we have all of this before Zechariah, before John is born. And then that is followed by the foretelling of the angel to Mary. So we have these two foretellings. Then Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And that's where I want us to look first. 
So in chapter 139, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped within her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. I love the image of Mary and Elizabeth coming together. And um, there is in, um, in outside of Jerusalem a place called the Church of the Visitation, which is where people believe Mary went to visit Elizabeth. Um, and there's a statue there of these two women, and they're both leaning into each other with their bellies. And what I love about it is almost like the babies are magnets drawing the two of them together. And it made me think about the way in which sometimes you are drawn to somebody because God is doing something in their life that's similar to what God is doing in your life. And what a joy it is to be with somebody that can kind of get that or who can walk with you so that you're not alone and saying, you know, I think God's called me to do this thing and I know it doesn't make any sense. And they can say, you know what, I'm, th I'm thinking the same thing. And all of a sudden, it seems a little less crazy. All right? So for Mary, who was told by God that she was going to conceive a child, and even though it's already happened, for her to not be able to quite get her head around that, but when she sees Elizabeth, she's like, okay, you know, if God can do this in Elizabeth, maybe this thing that's happening to me makes sense. It is so important as we are growing and walking to be with people who are growing. If you want to get to the next level in faith, find somebody who wants to get to the next level. Seek out strong people, all right? And seek out someone who's a little bit further down the road than you, okay? So that you can begin to um, learn how they got there and what their story is and how that might help you on your way. Okay, now we get to the Magnificat. Um, 46, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her for about three months and then returned to her home. So now, when you hear that song, what, and I'm going to ask you to come to the mic, what do you notice? What do you hear? What do you notice in the Magnificat? Yeah. Wow. That's great. Yes, there is a sense of humility in this. Any others? There is one. Yes. Yes. There is this joy as well. So this humility and joy, which, you know, if you're going to be used by God, those would be two good characteristics to have. Um, humility and joy at being used. Anything else? 
What do we want to make of these lines? He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. like something we hear in the Old Testament. It does. Do you know where it might be from in the Old Testament? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. On my app here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see one on uh, 1 Samuel yes. 2. Yes, yes. That's it. Two. That's Hannah's song. So when Hannah, who was barren, has a child, she has a song that is filled with reversals. That God brings down the mighty and God lifts up the lowly. So here's our motivation for being humble. If you're humble, there's nowhere to go but up. All right? So think of it that way. Um, but Mary's song reflects, mirrors, and actually has some phrases from Hannah's song. Um, yay, Old Testament points. All right? All the good stuff in the New Testament was in the Old. Um, yes. Yes, very good. All right. Um, so before Jesus comes on the scene, I want you to think about what we have. We have a story of Zechariah. We have two birth narratives or two prophecies of birth. And then we have the Magnificat. And after the Magnificat, John the Baptist is born. And then after John the Baptist is born, we have Zechariah's prophecy. So look at verse 67 in chapter 1. After the child is born and after he gets his voice back, because remember, the Lord closed his mouth. Now he can finally say something. He's like, I got something to say. Um, his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. But you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God. The dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's interesting because many people are more familiar with Mary's Magnificat than they are with Zachariah's prophecy. But go back to one of the characteristics that we identified in the Gospel of Luke and pairings. So we have pairings of prophecies around birth. We have pairings of these two um, births together. We have the birth of John the Baptist, and then we're going to hit the birth of Jesus. But when it comes to the prophetic word, we have Mary's Magnificat and Zechariah's prophecy. All right? So that the Magnificat can then be understood as a prophetic word, just like Zacharias, that they're both speaking to the way that God moves in the world, all right? And so it's a lovely way to think about the pairing then of those two. We get two prophetic words about God and how God is going to use God's people, all right? And then that concludes then with a little summary about John the Baptist. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. Okay, questions about anything we just went over in chapter 1? Okay. I am assuming that there is great familiarity with chapter 2. So in chapter 2, we have the birth narrative of Jesus. Is there anyone who would like me to go, go over that a little bit more slowly? Just put your hand up real quick. Nobody has, else has to see. Everybody look ahead. Okay. Yeah, everybody's like looking around. Who wants to know? Just everybody pay for it. Okay, so we look in the beginning and we have this, the circumstances of the birth of Jesus. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus. All the world would be registered or taxed. And then we get this whole 
um, the information about why this registration was taken and who um, was behind it. Verse 3, everyone went to their own place to be registered. Joseph then went from Nazareth in Galilee. So Joseph was from Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth, um, and New King James, King James says swaddling clothes. These would have been what was available to them under the circumstances. It's not what you would nor ordinarily wrap a child in. These would have been grave clothes, technically. Um, laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And then we have the shift from the birth of Christ to the shepherds, um, to whom the angels come. Why does, does anyone wonder why the angels came to shepherds? Why did they come to the shepherds? Okay. Okay, they would have they would have been more receptive. Okay. Good. Any other thoughts on why they would have come to the shepherds? I mean, they could have gone anywhere. Well, they were out on their way to the shepherds. Who knows who they passed? Why did they come to the shepherds? Okay, so maybe they were, as a mobile group, they could have spread the good news. I like that. Anything else? The shepherds were at the bottom rung okay. of society. Okay, so they would have been not in the upper echelons. They would have been the common folk, the folks down at the bottom, all right? So if we follow that, that meant that Jesus came to the least of these, right? And they got this big show with the angels and this good news. It came to them first. So that would fit in with Mary's whole thing about lifting up the lowly and bringing down the mighty. Any other ideas on why they would have come to the shepherds? Uh, when you talk about it just runs with the narrative of what was to come what what Jesus would be uh, to the people he would be the, the great shepherd okay so I think it just kind of runs just kind of runs with the narrative kind of okay. puts everything to perspective okay. when you talk about uh, the spring of the okay that's interesting Jesus then be, symbolically becomes our shepherd Jesus says I am the good shepherd what does the 23rd Psalm say the Lord is my shepherd Okay, so when we think of shepherd, we always think of shepherd as somebody out with the sheep. That's what a shepherd is. But in the ancient world, shepherd was also associated with king. So when you say the 23rd Psalm and say the Lord is my shepherd, you're also saying the Lord is my king. All right, this is why it was a big deal that King David, before he was king, was a shepherd. So that that tending of the sheep is also symbolic of ruling a nation, all right? So shepherd and king could have, been, in, in, in the Old Testament and poetry, would have been used interchangeably, that that would have been a symbol. A shepherd would have been a symbol of a ruler. So Jesus, the angels coming to the shepherds, then serve several purposes. You have Jesus coming to the lowly, but it's also saying that Jesus is going to be shepherd king, all right? So one of the things I love about scripture is that it can do more than one thing at once, all right? Now, we might always be looking for one thing, and that's okay, because that can be a good thing, but that doesn't mean there's not more, all right? Which is why it's so important to keep digging and to keep asking questions and to go back to the things that you already know, all right? Because there's always more to be uncovered. Okay, the angels come, glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Uh, shepherds go, see Jesus. Look at verse 21. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child. Excuse me, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. All right, so Jesus is the Greek version of Jesus' name. The Hebrew name would have been Yeshua, which is what? Joshua, which means salvation. 
all right? So it's important that we get the name because in the biblical world, your name goes to your purpose, all right? So if your name is Jesus, if your name is Yeshua, um, your job is to be a deliverer, a savior, and that is why this child was born. This is the name that the angel said he would have, and when the time comes for him to be circumcised and he has his naming ceremony, this is what he is named. And this is to show that everything is um, in accordance with what the angel said. And then we have Jesus' presentation in the temple. He is presented. So according to the law of Moses, after a woman gives birth, there's a period of time that she has to wait to be purified. And that is when the child is brought to the temple. And that's what it's making reference to when it says they brought him up um, according to the law of Moses. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. They give a sacrifice. And then we have Simeon and who? Pairing. Pairing. Okay. Here we have again this man of God and this woman of God. So Luke is always interested in reminding us, um, and she's a prophet, which is even, even better. Um, so she began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. All right, they go back to Nazareth, and then we see in 40, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So think about that, and think about the verse we had with John the Baptist. John the Baptist grows and becomes strong, and is in the wilderness. Now we have Jesus growing and becoming strong, so that this is um, organized so that we have these two parallel birth stories about Christ, the Savior, and the forerunner, John the Baptist. And then we bring Jesus into the temple at the end of chapter 2. And this is when Jesus was 12 years old, um, verse 43. When the festival was ended, they started to return. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not knowing, know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. I don't think that's how she sounded when she said it, but that's how I'm saying it. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and years and in divine and human favor. So look at what we have there with Jesus Increasing in wisdom in years, go back to verse 40, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now look down to Mary in verse um, 51, his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Okay, so let's unpack this passage a little bit. Um, they go to Jerusalem for the Passover, and Jesus, they lose Jesus. Um, Mary and Joseph lose their child, and um, they assume because they're traveling with a large party that he's somewhere with his friends. They can't find him. They have to go all the way back, and then they have to look for him. Now, just imagine what the DEF CON level was with those parents by the time they saw him, right? So our joke always is when your child is in a dangerous thing, you say, are you all right? And as soon as they say yes, then you lay into them, right? Yeah. All right, because if you're not dead now, I will kill you. Um, so there is all of that, and Jesus is unmoved. What does he say? Right? Now, so what is Joseph saying? I'm your daddy. Um, okay, so I mean, there's a lot going on here in terms of who Jesus is, right? And the fact that how it's already we have tension between what it means that Jesus is fully human and fully God. And we take it for granted all the time, but it, we get it 
and we get it wrong all the time. I don't know how else to say it. In other words, the, the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully human is a mystery, which means that whenever we get comfortable with one, the other side shows up. Whenever we start thinking about Jesus as fully God, then he does something really human. And we start thinking about Jesus as really human, then he does something that's really God-like. And so there's a way in which the incarnation always eludes us. It's always beyond us. We can never get too comfortable with Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my shepherd. Jesus is my friend. But he's not my friend like Mary Lou. Okay? That there is something about Jesus that is different. Okay? So when um, there's a series of... Um, children's stories that I love um, by C.S. Lewis called The Chronicles of Narnia. And in The Chronicles of Narnia, the main character is a lion called Aslan. And Aslan is like the Christ figure in the story. But every now and then they will say of Aslan, he's not a tame lion. He's not a tame lion. Just because he's kind, don't forget who he is. Just because God comes to us in human form, don't forget who he is. And Mary and Joseph have to constantly readjust and remember. And I think we have to constantly readjust and remember that just because we've known Jesus for X number of years and just because Jesus loves me and Jesus takes care of me doesn't mean that Jesus is not going to ask something of you that will cut you to the quick. It doesn't mean that Jesus will not allow you to go through something that you think is unimaginable. Because Jesus, for all the things that we love about Jesus that are warm and fuzzy, is God. And God is beyond us. We don't always understand God, and we clearly don't control God. And so there's a way in which we, like Mary and Joseph, are going to find ourselves in situations where we thought Jesus was with us, but somewhere along the line, we left Jesus. And we have to find our way back to Jesus. And in that journey, we are reminded that we don't get to control the work of God in our lives. Okay? All right. Um, all right, we're going to stop there. So what I want you to do is for next week, Let's see if you can read verses, I'm sorry, verses, chapters 3 through 10. We won't get beyond that, she says. Okay. One more thing I want you to think about when we think about the Gospel of Luke and um, Luke's use of women and representation of women we talk about John the Baptist as the forerunner to Jesus, and that's right. But what, of, what about Elizabeth as the forerunner to John? Hmm? I'm sorry? To John. That's her child. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can put it the other way if you want, but I want you to begin to think about forerunners extending beyond John the Baptist, okay? That maybe the story doesn't start there, okay? Okay, all right, any questions? We got three minutes if there's a question. Um, I just have a question about um, what you were saying about when they traveled and they left Jesus. Is it, is it common, was it common back in those days to travel like for a day's worth without stopping and resting? Because every time I read that part, it always bothered me because I know if I can't find one of my children for a millisecond, I'm in like a panic. So I was always trying to figure out like is that right. just common in those right. days? Well, it would have so been big? extended family. And the oh. Texas, they thought he was with his cousins. Okay. You know, so if you think about it, you've got... You see a bunch of children over there, and you just think, oh, Jesus is over there, because that would have been how they traveled. 
right? So that it wasn't that, yeah, they, they were confident he was somewhere in the mix. Yeah, it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful image if you think about it, because in one sense, it gives us insight into um, extended family and community where the expectation would have been that, well, somebody's, somebody's got him. I just wanted to say one thing um, based on Shanika's comment. Can you imagine what Mary felt like? Like, I had one job, <laughs> and I lost the <laughs> child that God, like, gave me. And I would have been freaking out the whole way, and the Bible just says she treasured all these things in her heart. Like, I, I was just thinking, like, I don't know what I would have been thinking that whole journey. That but, like, is so God funny. God gave me one thing to do, and, and I, I have no idea where the child went. You know, so I thought it was funny. <laughs> I, I never thought about it that way. That's great. That's great. I had one job. Um, that's good.